is making no promises and end curfew and end of COVID, or is it? The new numbers and the new fears. What now? On Jamila's memo, the dangers of a single story, the bad manners in politics and the stinking hypocrisy. Gashuri punches into the folly of political violence. On the kicker, the tales of Kenyan sex workers and memories of Britain's gulag. Along the angle tonight, a climate of uncertainty as the world heads to Glasgow in Scotland. None of us can be able to deliver free, fair and credible elections on their own. We depend on each other. Each of these agencies has something to do with elections within their mandate. And as a commission, we must work together with each and every one of them to be able to deliver to Kenyans a free and fair elections. Uh, shortly, we will be um, adding uh, 5,500 police officers who are coming out of college shortly and 300 specially trained cadet police officers who will work and beef up the work of the IBC to conduct the elections. All right, so uh, some commitments there, and we'll come back to those ones in a moment. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we should start from a place where there is absolutely no commitment from anybody, it seems, mm -hmm. to uh, follow the COVID-19 rules now that um, the curfew is out. It almost seems, Jamila, and welcome back, by the way. Thank you. It almost seems like uh, COVID ended the day the president said no more curfew. Yeah, yeah, it seems so. I've been, I've been away. I, I came back recently, and uh, while I was away, where I was, <laughs> um, the curfew was lifted yes. while I was there. And, and, and um, I found that very interesting, in, in following it on, on social media and, and, and on television, how happy people were. Because remember, we've mentioned this quite a few times, and Gashuri says it a lot, when you allow politicians to do what they want, and then you deny um, a Kenyan who has a job maybe in the entertainment industry, maybe one who organizes events, what are you telling them that they cannot do this, and you allow politicians to do it? So with the curfew being lifted, there's that... The uh, fact that people are able to work more, we, night travel is back, we have people who can go into clubs <coughs> and, 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 and all that, people, we don't have to try and close work early because of curfew. But there's also maybe the danger of uh, maybe having a bit too much and misusing it in terms of maybe general complacency on, uh, complacency on our part as individuals letting loose and engaging in night activities, meaning more risks because COVID-19 is still here. We still get the daily numbers, yes. The WHO uh, directive that, uh, or the WHO assessment that says that if you have less than 5% for two weeks, it means the curve is going down. And we've had less than 5% for much longer than two weeks, which is good. The numbers have been 1.9%, 2.2%, less than 5 for a while. And it's really, really good for us. But COVID-19 is still there. Yes, we are vaccinating more and more people. But um, we have seen countries where now they've started giving people a third dose. Where I was... They announced it uh, Which in the past few days. Uh, so just tell us where you I were. I was in Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Serious, why are we being coy about all this? <laughs> I was in Saudi Arabia and they started a third, um, a third dose. <coughs> and while I was there, I was not wearing masks too, a lot because everyone has been vaccinated. In fact, when you're outdoors, you don't need to wear a mask. People were wearing masks indoors and business was going on till late. Because of the heat, um, people uh, open and, and obviously, shops I mean, and in the morning. About, just about five million people Five vaccinated. million people, yeah, yeah we're vaccinated. Still quite far. We're doing, but we're doing okay compared to other yeah. African countries but my point is this let's not misuse this yeah. COVID-19 is still here let's not have complacency let's not have politicians now having those night meetings all over again they can extend it what <coughs> but let's not uh, to see Jerry be COVID yeah yeah I mean I mean Linus uh, we have done well uh, relatively speaking I mean in terms of vaccination and and, and, and all the all the efforts but seems if anyone came to this country they would actually think everybody has been vaccinated we have long banished COVID-19 from our borders uh, actually more than that uh, it, it actually looks like we are all back from our third booster shot because <laughs> things are very very uh, normal but if you look at the vaccination uh, figures they're actually not that encouraging uh, the latest figures from the Ministry of uh, Health is that the total percentage of adults that have been uh, vaccinated as at today is about 5.7 percent of our population. total population. That tells you in simple math that 94.3 are covered by the Lord's grace mm. because the vaccination is not that complete. 
Um, I think we need to not celebrate too soon and not to drop the guard that soon. What needs to go up this uh, really urgently is the number of uh, vaccination, uh, of, the, of the number of people who have been vaccinated. Something that we can say is encouraging is the increasingly, uh, increasing availability of the <coughs> vaccines. Uh, look, these days we talk of many, many options. There's Johnson & Johnson, there's Moderna, we talk of uh, AstraZeneca. Fi Pfizer, yes. Uh, Pfizer. And these things, remember a few months ago, were unthinkable on our shows. We were talking of uh, mm. vaccine racism and things like that. We were sounding frustrated as not just Kenyans, but as Afri the African race. We were not <coughs> getting anywhere with the, uh, in terms of access to this uh, vaccine. So, so it is encouraging that we have more access. But I think some work needs to go to sensitization of the public to just ramp up those numbers and ask people to get the first, second uh, jab of the vaccine. And, and Francis, the uh, past experience basically uh, shows us that uh, it's very easy to move from a positivity rate of 1%, 2% like what we are seeing now to a shutdown. Absolutely. And um, two things. Kwanzaa, I'm happy that f at least finally uh, when President Uhuru Kenyatta announced that he has lifted the curfew, it ended the animal farm that was that curfew. Because it was not making sense for anybody to have politicians and everybody else do their thing during the day without a care, and then in the evening, <coughs> tell those who re rely and depend on the night economy that, hey, stay at home because there's COVID-19. It was not making sense at all. But now, the responsibility shifts to individual citizens directly. You are on your own. It is your, it is your personal responsibility, one, to look for the vaccine, and number two, to take care of yourself, um, to, to ensure that you don't contract the, the virus. Personal responsibility has been the main issue all along. So now it, the burden is greater on individual citizens. So while we enjoy the freedom and the, and, and the lifting of the curfew, it also relies on our responsibility as citizens to do the right thing whether you're in a religious area, you know, in a house of worship, where, whether you're at home, whether you're attending a rally, whether you're attending, a, you know, sports and everything else, just be responsible. Um, it is your personal issue. Because on one hand, we were dealing with many people who had lost jobs and who are relying on the night economy and who are suffering. But at the same time, you had to deal with protecting lives. And because we can't be contained and locked up forever, we had to get to a point where lives and livelihoods side by side, personal responsibility. That's what I would say. Yvonne, you know, there's a guy who says that uh, we can blame the government for not enforcing, but the government eventually, at the end of the day, doesn't get sick. It mm -hmm. is yeah. just individuals who, who do. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and I can't get over this idea of politicians. <coughs> it almost seems like throughout this period, even at the worst times in this COVID journey, mm. The politicians actually seem to play by a different set of rules. Sometimes it's even some politicians as opposed to others. Others, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, the, the stratification goes mm -hmm. on, um, you know, as, as you go. I mean, for me, I think it's just um, what's been said here is to consolidate on the gains. Um, like we've said, we've had an average now of 2%, somewhere between 1.5 and 2% positivity rate for, you know, a good amount of time now. Um, we now have, I think, up to five vaccines that are available in the market. What's most encouraging as well is that you know we're no longer depending on uh, the donations uh, that we're getting in the form of um, Oxford AstraZeneca we're now purchasing our own Pfizer Moderna including the one from China also available in the country so we need to do a lot more of this also encouraging to hear is the possibility of us uh, making or producing or shall I say putting together those mm -hmm. vaccines here there's a foam and fill um, you know plant that we're expecting to be operational I think by next year mm -hmm. there's also the good news that's coming out of Rwanda, that there's you know a plant that will be opening up there as well but it's to just continue to consolidate on all of those gains and to just uh, remember going forward I cannot imagine you know the tough thing about uh, managing lives versus livelihoods um, and maybe just maybe 2021 will have better tidings than last year but like we've all said vigilance because 
Um, there's a new variant, um, and it's actually it's a sub-variant of Delta. It's mm -hmm. now known as Delta Plus, and it's caused a spike in COVID infections in Europe. So they're now starting to increase their surveillance at their ports of entry. And so it's just to tell us that we're not done with this yet. And you know, we cannot slide back into it. Uh, but one of the things that we need to start looking at going forward is some more targeted interventions and measures. So rather than um, countrywide or nationwide lockdowns, um, rather than restriction of movement, you can now, you know, deal with little epicenters. Remember what happened in the beginning with Old Town in Mombasa, mm -hmm. with Isli, it would now be to identify areas where there have been infections and deal with it at a localized level rather than something that is more widespread. So that is where we're going, but you know, like everybody else, has said is just to remember we're in a pandemic and my worry is that we have opened up i mean have you seen the number of concerts that are you know taking place this weekend i'm not sure that covid protocols will be observed there i hope they will and also more uh, importantly we're going into the festive season so we're going to see open travel we're going to see cross-border travel night travel lots of people congregating so if there's any time we needed to be careful it is now. Um, and I think everyone also <coughs> I noticed uh, with, with, with traveling, um, you could not leave without the COVID-19 vaccine certificate. Mm. It was important here in Nairobi. It was important when you arrived in, in, in Riyadh. And also, of course, the tests, the negative tests as you leave and as you come back, despite the vaccine and what you're seeing and easing of restrictions, those are still very, very important across the world. No traveling unless you've been given both vaccines. My, my, only, my only worry, Joe, is uh, even after the, re uh, the curfew was lifted, um, during the Mashujaa Day celebrations, President Uhuru Kenyatta gave a list of 13 areas that will be targeted for economic stimulus. Mm. The whole of this week, I've not heard anything uh, being said about it. Um, and they were to commence on 1st of November. 1st of November is two days away. A few of those need to be done by Parliament. Yeah. yeah. Um, National Treasury, for instance, with the one on CRB, needs to convene those stakeholders. Um, that is yet to happen, at least as far as uh, yeah. we know. So um, there's, there's a lot of talk about those uh, 13 interventions and whether they will be um, Very good you know, on helpful. paper. Now yes. move it from paper to practical. There we go. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, didn't... Uh, Thomas Jefferson, I think that's disputed, but Thomas Jefferson is said to have said that um, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Yep. Mm -hmm. I guess it couldn't be more apt than now. All right, let's follow up th that with, I was misquoted. <laughs> 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 uh, yes, um, I guess the, the, the truth of the statement it remains all the same. Yeah. But let's get to our own situation here. <coughs> uh, we call it the transfer, political transfer window. Season, yeah. mm. uh, and I think that uh, it would be a good idea right now to listen to the Kirinyaga governor, Anwai Guru, when... Uh, what number is that, Kashuri? Uh, <laughs> I, like, I, I like the way, I like the way you're, you're putting it. <laughs> the defection. Yes. Tumevuka, number 19. Yes. Yeah, Tumevuka. <laughs> So sisi tumeamua tumevuka. Nimesikia chama ni UDA na form ni na form ni hasla. Even on this other side we have also been waiting for this moment. <laughs> because we all knew it is going to happen. <laughs> when was the problem? Uh, Lina, you know, I was going to go to, uh, the, or there was a time in this country when the word defection was actually very strange. Mm -hmm. I think it started uh, with the likes of Protas, Momani, Apili, Wawire, and that, that, that group. But let's not go there. I, 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 I thought a lot of people saw this coming. I mean, Anwai Guru mm -hmm. had um, uh, a, a long journey to get to Karen in that manner. And I think the last couple of weeks have been particularly agonizing for her. She's been uh, prevaricating a lot this way, that way. Um, was this expected from where you sit? I think it was. There were all indications that uh, Anwai Guru was holding the handles of two doors. And she could have ended up in any. And uh, I wouldn't even say this is done we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. This is Kenya. Defections are part of the norm, especially pre-election and even post-election. And you had mentioned uh, 
the, the tradition, and, and uh, I, I want to just talk a bit about that because there's a lot of symbolism that goes into uh, defections. Defections are also used as a political weapon to weaken the opponent and to strengthen uh, you, yourselves. In a big way, uh, the UDA made a point this week, especially in the intra-jubilee wars, uh, because the, 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 the scene is so clouded right now with so many things in terms of political activity and political um, uh, alignments that we forget that this is um, a culmination of things that started way back with the battle between uh, Kieleweke and Tangatanga wings of, of Jubilee. And we will see in the coming days some of this movement, not just in the direction of UDA, but also in the direction of UDA going to Jubilee or even going to uh, ODM or whatever will result in this alliance uh, between President Uhuru Kenyatta and Raila Odinga. Because eventually what will happen, and, and some analysts sat here including um, uh, Man Manyora, Professor Manyora and, uh, and, and Kagwanja and also weighed in on, on what they see as a scene that will change come next year when things now take shape formally before the election on the 9th of August uh, 2022. So it's a, it, these are the preliminary stages and a big score for UD8 must be uh, given because of the of one simple thing. In the weeks that preceded uh, Waiguru's defection, uh, Raila Odinga had done a Mount Kenya tour and got endorsement of seven uh, sitting governors in what is considered the larger uh, Mount Kenya region. And uh, DP William Ruto is getting the first endorsement from a sitting governor uh, through uh, Anne Waiguru. So um, what are we going to see in the weeks uh, ahead? Are we going to see more names now falling in line and saying either UDA or, or coming this way? So this is a season opener. Uh, can we call it the community shield? <laughs> <laughs> Francis, um, how did it come to this? Um, it was obvious. And the clearest indicator that uh, the Kirinyaga governor was on her way to the Hustlers mansion was on uh, Wednesday at Wanguru Stadium in Kirinyaga County. Um, you could see the body language when she invited the deputy president to address the gathering. And I remember that smile. Yeah, I remember you a, said that. A certain smile at the end of her speech. And you could tell. And I remember uh, covering her at the integrity center. And when she, s she claimed that the reason why she was being investigated for corruption was because of her statement that she was considering her political move. And you could tell the direction. But even more prominently, there's a day she was accompanied by uh, Kirinyaga County MCAs led by the majority leader, Kamau Morango. And she asked the people, and I remember LK talking, uh, uh, was saying it was, um, it was, it was like an opi a, a public, public opinion, opinion poll. poll. Yeah. A street opinion poll. Yeah, a street opinion, 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 opinion poll. And yeah. asked them, which party would you want and me to join? Yeah. And they shouted UDA. Yeah. And she said in Kikuyu, I've had you. Also note, she was yeah. wearing yellow on that day. Yeah. So Symbolism. Uh, there, there were quite some symbolic things that could tell the direction she was heading. And of course, a lot of these things uh, behind the tent, uh, we get to know them. Uh, and so there was no surprise whatsoever um, when she made her move public. And, and even way before the pictures started leaking and you know, we were told that um, she was moving <coughs> to, to, to Karen, they, there were a lot of SMSs and you know, WhatsApp messages that had del the governor and her delegation were heading to Karen. So there was no surprise whatsoever. Um, was it expected totally? What would I attribute it to? Pure and simple, survival, political survival, and especially in a county like Kirinyaga. Has the governor had a simple and easy life in Kirinyaga as governor? Certainly no. Uh, does she have some serious competition in her re-election bid? Certainly. Does she have challenges with specific people and groupings in Kirinyaga county? Definitely. You remember her protracted contest with health workers in the county. Yeah. 
a good number of them have never forgiven her um, because of um, let, letting them go away, um, sacking them if you may like. She has, had, she has also had a tiff with the Interior Affairs uh, Principal Secretary. And you remember that handshake between uh, Dr. Kibicho and um, uh, Andrew yep. Girishi, mm -hmm. the husband to the woman mm -hmm. rep. So there were all telltale signs that she was not having it easy politically in the county. Was she looking for survival and a certain push uh, as she seeks re-election in 2022? Certainly. Why? Because if you were to ask a good number of people in Kirinyaga County today, DP's UDA party is, is strong on the ground, is popular. Um, at least as, as at now, um, does the deputy president command, you know, support in the county? He does. Uh, you could see in Kirinyaga during the Mashujia Day celebrations. And so I would think if you're to, if you're to look at how uh, Anwe Guru became governor in 2017, the jubilee wave in the Mount Kenya region and certainly in Kirinyaga, President Huru Kenyatta's role in her election and even going there to campaign for her, it should tell you something. And how tight the race was between her and Mother Karua, the Na Kenya leader, a contest that went all the way to the mm. Supreme Court, you could tell that it was not an easy it, ride for her. And so this move certainly expected. Why? Survival. And, and, and it's interesting how quickly things change, Yvonne, because this is the same Anwai Guru who just uh, not too long ago uh, went around um, the region with uh, Raila Odinga, actually said Raila Odinga, <coughs> uh, I think, had got 40% or only needed 40% mm. and, and, and basically saying the mountain had accepted Raila Odinga. And this was at the height of, of BBI. And, and I, I remember very well how she spoke when BBI fell apart in the Court of Appeal. And that uh, was definitely, without a doubt, a major turning point for, for Anwai Guru. And a lot of people will be wondering, I mean, if BBI had gone through, yeah. Would we have seen uh, what happened at Karen this week? Precisely. And I was actually going to just say, I think, you know, her move to um, UDA started um, when BBI failed at, at the appeals court. And she'd started to send out all of these signals. I think she put up a post on Facebook saying she's reconsidering the position. And you can understand, BBI was um, this vehicle that offered a lot of opportunities for many people who were probably fighting for their um, local survival. So, you know, even if you add uh, the Martha Karua factor into that, who is, you know, another strong contender, who is the head of her party. She's a party leader of uh, Na Kenya. She wouldn't have to struggle too much with nominations in, in that regard. You had uh, Purity Ngirichi on the other side. So this was obviously um, just reminding us about everything when it comes to a general election is that politics is local. And just another thing I think for everybody to remember is you're going to see shifts and turns and what looks like betrayal and people who are enemies now being friends and vice versa. Isn't it interesting that, um, you know, she went to Karen with 23 MCAs, the same MCAs who, you know, voted to impeach her. Um, now they are together and she's actually leading them in a delegation um, towards defecting to UDA. I suspect this is the first of many, like we've said, it's a political window season. Uh, the political window? transfer window mm -hmm. um clearly <laughs> these sports terms are not my thing um but it's, it's it's definitely going to be one we have what about um because october is pretty much over november december uh january february march, march april, april yeah. we have about six months to the time that party <coughs> primaries should be done if you take a look at where we are with the electoral calendar uh, the party primaries are slated to happen between the 16th of april and the 22nd of april mm -hmm. um and even after that um Anyone who might be unhappy, you know, the, the fallout from political party primaries, as we know happens, they have until May of that year to then, uh, you know, resign from their parties and run uh, as independents. It is six months. We are going to see movement from Jubilee to UDA, UDA to Jubilee, um, uh, ODM to WIPA. In fact, and there, 
you know, rumors now that there are talks between um, Raila and Kalonzo, the same Kalonzo who not more than six months ago said, you know, to the effect, words to the effect of I'd rather die, I will not do this and I will not support him again. Now they're talking about that and where would that leave the One Kenya Alliance? Um, so there's going to be so much movement because they've got six months to start to figure out, um, you know, which party is strong on the ground, which presidential candidate has a lot of support on the ground and therefore you can ride on that popularity that takes you um, uh, forward. So uh, if we think we've seen this, this is, I, I think, um, you know, kudos to her for opening uh, the window. But there are those who will ask, uh, Joe, what will um, uh, Anwar Guru's move to the UDA deny the Raila Odinga team? Um, she's a um, politician from central Kenya who's been vocal uh, from the beginning. She won the Kirinyaga um, seat, governor's seat, beating uh, Martha Karuan. Of course, you spoke about how the case went all the way to the high court. She has been, she's in the past, she's really supported BBI and the handshake. She um, even supported, I remember in 2019, I think during the by-elections for Kibra, she was one of those mm. Jubilee members of, of, of Jubilee politicians who really supported it. And then... Um, She's been very vocal, uh, vocal, talking about how central Kenya is ready for a Raila Odinga presidency, and now she's shifted. So what will she deny the Raila Odinga team? Yes, we spoke about how many governors are supporting him currently and how many are not. Um, number two, you talk about how politics is local. Mm -hmm. And um, she's gone into a party where her biggest, probably so far, rival, um, the woman rep, Ngerishi, has been in for a long time. She supported Deputy President uh, William Ruto for a while. She's been in, in, in UDA. Of course, she's welcomed and said, just come on, but Bring I know I'm on. going to win this nomination because she said she's not going to be to accept being told no more. She wants to be the governor of Kirinyaga. So that's, I think, one of the battlegrounds you're going to see in different parts of this country. I think it brings a sort of headache for, for probably... Um, UDA leader um, William Ruto and also uh, Raila Odinga because they'll need to work harder to avert splits in their parties during these party nominations because they've promised that these nominations will be free and fair. And uh, there are instances, there are places where some of their favorites, some of, okay, not, we can't say favorites, some of the and notable names in their parties are running for, are want to vie for the same seat. So how are you going to decide who gets it? Are you going to let the people decide? And what will that do to the whole process of democratic process of nomination? We've seen instances where people have decided to vote for the person they wanted, even though he was not given the party ticket because they want the person. Are we going to see a lot more independent candidates come in this uh, next general election? So this whole issue of nomination is huge. And we say this before in some areas in this country, domination will be a bigger battle than the actual election yeah. because Wukipata Tikiti Achama Fulani in a particular place, you're almost eschewing. So getting that Tikiti, um, I think, is a bigger battle than the actual election. And that's why you heard DP yeah. Ruto saying, you know, there will be no violence, there will be no, you know, the party primaries is, is that's really and it. That's and that's usually easier said than done. I it mean, is, especially yeah. in places where those parties are mm -hmm. considered to be too strong. Yeah. Where actually, in you're fact, there the was a study candidate. I was looking at not too long ago where most of the spending in, 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 in terms of uh, what, what candidates actually lay out during the campaigns happens during the nominations. Because in some places, once you get the nomination, you're basically home and dry. I mean, you've done 90% of mm -hmm. what you needed to do. So most of the spending actually happens in the run up to the nominations and on the nomination itself. So the rest of it becomes uh, sort of uh, down the slope. Uh, yeah. Joe, the, the nomination headache is across the political parties. And certainly the political parties that are seen strong. as the big parties or the mm -hmm. strong political parties. And that nomination challenge is both intra-party and inter-party. Mm -hmm. Intra-party because you will have two or three strong candidates seeking the same ticket, um, uh, let's say in a governor's race or something like that. And a lot of horse trading comes in. Uh, you'll see discussions like, instead of vying for a governor's seat, why don't you come uh, a rank lower, vie for a parliamentary seat, for mm -hmm. example, or even, let's say, vie for a woman position, mm -hmm. for a Senate position. Um, and if they can't agree, then you invite inter-party kind of a contest. Why? Because yeah. a party will want a weak candidate for their opponent. Yeah. So there will be a lot of infiltration. And more so when you resort to a scenario where you say you can use the voter register as the document that will be used to identify voters or people who will participate in nominations. Most of the political parties between now and that period will be forced to do a lot of recruitment and have 
registers that will be used to nominate candidates. You remember the Jubilee fiasco in 2017 that even forced a repeat nomination exercise. And so you will not be too far away to think that you can see similar kind of situations. I spoke to Ongoe um, Ngirishi, the woman rep in Kirinyaga, about that particular question of nominations. And um, number 14, she had something <laughs> interesting to tell me. So we want to ask Wafulache Bukati to do a letter to President Uhuru Kenyatta. And I would claim clearly the mandate of the... <laughs> yeah. Let's get the right one. Uh, Abs Ngirishi um, telling, um, telling, telling us For that she's in the race to the end. This is a party. Inokuwa, iko laini kabisa. So what wa kirinyaka kwa mba wanajua ni nani ambaye wanataka. Kwa hivo, ata imepunguza wale ambao ni tashindana nao. Kwa sasa tukishindana pale kwa nominations za UDA, itamushinda, alafu sasa, ndakuwa na watu wengine few. Kwa sababu saa hii wale wame declare, ni karibu watu kumi, kumi na mboja hivi. Mbona niambiwe, wali niambia ni kuja, yuma, yuma nirepu ni kikuja. Kimimi ni kuja kwa, kwa hiyari yangu. So, nitaendelea na hiyo ya ugavana, mtu wakitaka ni change, ya ya hende ya change yake, lakini mimi yangu, itabadilisha, itakuwa vile vile, naendea ugavana, itaenda mbaka wadi mwisho. Na ninajua mimi kwamba 2022, by August, kumi, nitakuwa nimetangazo mshindi. Yeah, because all politics is local, and so... A lot of these nomination challenges and headaches, you'll see them, especially in these polit big political parties. Now, the challenge or the bigger question is party leadership, be it ODM, be it WIPA, be it KANU, be it uh, UDA, be it Jubilee or what remains of Jubilee. How will the leaders in those political parties mm. manage the nomination process? Because that will be the biggest challenge. And how you manage the nominations has a bearing on, let's say, the turnout, and the performance yeah. of that political party in and the its main presidential election candidate. and its presidential candidate yeah. in the main race in August 2020. And are we going to see yeah. a lot more briefcase parties now? Those that have been registered in Aziko already Kumali. They are there. Yes. Yes. Unleash. Because yes. I think the date is, if they've closed uh, the date for when you can register for a party mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. election. What was the number, Gashuri, if you mm -hmm. can remember? The About 83 politi registered political parties 83. Now. And yeah, but also 18th of October, that's when the last day w Elisha. by which you had to do the, mm -hmm. uh, present the nomination rules. Yes without which then you cannot mm -hmm. participate. Mm. Lin Linus, you need to take us to the break. Before I take you to the break, <laughs> Joe, uh, <laughs> I, I think we spent quite a substantial amount of time talking about party politics as if they actually matter. I don't think they do. We are overrating uh, party <laughs> politics around this table. Because the truth is we are a word of mouth democracy uh, that revolves around personalities, very specific personalities. Uh, Anwe Guru was not just going to UDA, she was going to the camp of William Ruto and leaving the camp of <coughs> Uru Kenyatta and Raila Odinga. There were names to those uh, defections. And in defections, I also want to look at it beyond uh, what we're calling around the table here, politics is local. There are national objectives and there are regional objectives in some of these things that include defections. Because in the case of Deputy President William Ruto, what he's looking at in the defection of uh, um, Anwe Guru is a foothold in Mount Kenya. Will she, will <coughs> Anwe Guru be that point man, uh, so to speak? Because we are a country of point men, and point men have decided elections from actually all the elections in this country um, for a long time. Point men do matter. You have to have uh, certain regional leaders who will have a say on your behalf, who will run things on your behalf. So I don't think uh, DP Ruto is necessarily looking for a person to be the best governor of Kirinyaga. I think he's looking for someone who will add weight to his, pol his presidential uh, bid. Now, when it comes to Anwe Guru, we may be approaching a moment where for the first time in her career, she has to take uh, political weight on the political weighing yeah. scale as herself. Because she has not had that opportunity. When you look at Anne Waiguru's political career, it is one that is supported by rocket boosters. The first rocket boosters, we knew nothing about Anne Waiguru before she was 
appointed cabinet secretary for devolution. Mm -hmm. And I know, I mean, you remember how the media uh, splashed photos uh, of her during the swearing in. It reminded me of a similar swearing in in 2003 when Jebi Kilimo, oh, yes. who Jebi. nobody knew about, yeah. uh, became the star in the media, in the papers and all that. Uh, first of all, because of the uh, 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 photogenic uh, attributes. And both Jebi Kilimo and, um, and Anwe Guru actually do uh, owe, owe a bit of photo, that photogenic uh, thing to the first media appearances. Because in a swearing in of cabinet secretaries, and there are many, they had this assured uh, place in the, in, in the papers. So if you compare Anwe Guru to her opponents, whether it's Wangui Ngirishi, who is uh, uh, quite reputed as a grassroots mobilizer, or, um, uh, or uh, Martha Karua, who has cut a national profile, you know, she, she, she started from the trenches. Anwe Guru's starts, story starts from the beginning. It starts from the middle, rather, not the beginning. Not like uh, Girishis, uh, not like um, Karuas. Karuas. It starts somewhere in the middle, and that middle is some floor of national treasury, where she now uh, was appointed as a, a CS devolution. So, and then her, you know, stories about close association with President Uhuru Kenyatta did play a role also in how she was perceived as candidate for governor of uh, Kirinyaga. Because when you are close to power, when you're close to the president who comes from the same region, you are halfway through the, the, the line in terms of the, of the electoral vote. So what I'm saying is, Anwe Guru is, ha is going to have to step on the weighing scale, and then her weight, her political weight, has to be measured in this political uh, weighing scale. Is she really, can she really be a regional appointment? Can she really be uh, the person that will tilt uh, the vote in favor of uh, Deputy President um, William Ruto in, in central Kenya? So, very interesting times ahead because she is not just going to be uh, uh, weighed in terms of the politics is local, but also regional and national weight. And this time, um, can the rocket booster be reversed? Because Deputy mm -hmm. President William Ruto needs to become president, so he's looking for supporters from the, from, from the regions and not the other way around. Interesting. Wow. Mm -hmm. so yeah, take let's us take to that break. break. <laughs> take us to the break then. Oh, we're heading to a break. <laughs> right away. <laughs>